Okay, I think it's... Uh, Hello? It's on. Okay, I think we'll have to start uh, because we have a quite a tight schedule. So I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, last and also public session uh, of a very productive and informative meeting that we've had for the last couple of days on HIV AIDS research, its history and future. So I will chair this um, last session together with uh, Dr. Warner Green uh, from San Francisco. I'm, my name is Anders Wallner and I'm from the Kalinske Institute in Sweden. So this first hour we will um, have three presentations given by John Cohen, who is a journalist and science writer, by Stefan Hildebrandt, who is a Swedish documentary filmmaker, and by Victoria Harden, who is a historian from uh, NIH. So first I then welcome John Cohen. Uh, he is a science writer and reporter, as I said, he specializes in medicine and is widely known for coverage of HIV and AIDS. Um, Mr. Cohen has written four non-fiction books on scientific topics and is widely published in magazines. He has been reported for science since 1990 and has also written for the New Yorker, Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times Magazine, Smithsonian Technology Reviews, and, and many, other, many other publications. So please, John. Thank you, Andrew. Should I put on the lab? Yeah. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, Here it is. Thank you. I have 20 minutes, so I'm going to race through my slides. Uh, if you've been at the meeting, um, you'll see that my talk is very different from everything that's been presented. Um, and if you haven't, uh, it, it's fine and you, you don't need to know anything about HIV to follow um, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, these, this is a word cloud I made um, of words that I've learned over the years covering HIV. I first wrote about HIV in 1986. Um, I was interviewed uh, on Fresh Air in 2004 by Dave Davies, who was sitting in for Terry Gross, and before we went on the air, he asked me, how should I introduce you? And I said, I'm an AIDS reporter. And he started laughing, and he said, what's that? You, really? You call yourself an AIDS reporter? And it, the, his question really struck me because I had never thought twice about it for many years. And there used to be a lot of people who covered uh, the epidemic. Uh, from that first era, I'm kind of the, the last one standing. Um, and why have I covered it this long? I asked myself that question, and it's because it's the most fascinating story for a journalist that I could possibly imagine. Um, it touches every aspect of science, every aspect of society, and it has taken me to about 50 countries. And um, m much of what I'm going to show you is based on my travels and what I've seen, but much of it is simply about the journalism that has occurred and the main stories that have um, attracted journalists. You'll find there's a theme in journalism that I think many people misunderstand, and it's conflict. Conflict drives narratives. It's used in Shakespeare, it's used in poetry, and it's also in journalism. And conflict is not negative. It's, it's things you don't know. It's ideas hitting each other, and sometimes it is controversy and scandal. This is the first report, which many people have shown at this meeting, um, of AIDS. And what many people haven't shown is that it was buried in the MMWR. The type 4 dengue infection in US travelers to the Caribbean took precedence. Um, I think that's interesting. And the word homosexual, uh, I learned at this meeting, was taken off the title. This is the first uh, day that the MMWR appears. The story does not appear in major newspapers. It is not in the New York Times. It's not in the Washington Post. It's, this is from the Santa Cruz Sentinel. Uh, pneumonia strain linked to homosexual lifestyle. That's a wire story from AP. This is the first New York Times story, July 3rd, 1981, when there's a second report in MMWR about a rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals. So now we've gone from pneumonia to cancer. Does the president have any reaction to the announcement of the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta that AIDS is now an epidemic, 600, over 600 cases? 
Yeah, yeah, over a third of them are done. It's known as gay plague. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, it's a pretty serious thing. That, uh, one in every three people that get this have died, and I wonder if the president is aware of it. I don't have it. Are you? Do you? You don't have it. Well, I'm relieved to hear that. Do you? Delighted. No, I you don't. Didn't, you didn't answer my question. Well, I just wondered, How do you know? Does the president, in other words, the White House looks on this as a great joke. No, I don't know anything about it, Lester. Um, I, I dug up the old transcripts from three of the first uh, presidential um, uh, press conferences about AIDS. They're all equally repulsive. That's how the federal government at the highest level responded to the epidemic when it surfaced. That's Larry Speaks, who's speaking for President Ronald Reagan. This is the first report of the virus being isolated. That's Francoise Barisinese, who's here. Um, this appeared in Science in May of 1983. And I didn't have uh, access to the French media, so I don't know how much they reported this. Um, this is a month later. It's the New York native, which had a long campaign questioning whether HIV indeed was the cause of AIDS. African swine fever virus was one of many um, possibilities that the New York native argued was causing um, the epidemic. This is the first major US magazine cover that I could find um, about the epidemic. Um, note that it's mysterious and deadly. Those are two key words for journalists that we use again and again when outbreaks and epidemics surface. Mysterious and deadly drives many stories, including Zika and microcephaly, why is Ebola exploding in West Africa? Those are things that um, attract a, a lot of attention. This is the uh, most famous scientific press conference of all time, I believe, on April 23rd, 1984. The day before it occurs, the New York Times runs a story that says uh, that the French have discovered the cause of AIDS. Um, then uh, there's a press conference at which uh, Bob Gallo, who's here and helped organize this meeting, is with Margaret Heckler the Secretary of Health and Human Services. She's made a goat of um, frequently for having said supposedly that there will be a vaccine in two years. That's not really what she said. What she said is there will be a vaccine ready for human testing within two years. An equally irresponsible statement um, because it did create a false impression that this was gonna be a chip shot. This was gonna be simple. Edward Brandt, who was there, the um, Assistant Secretary, did say there would be a vaccine on the market within a few years but she didn't. Bob Gallo that day um, was uh, said at the podium, there has never been any fights or controversies between us and a group of, in, in France, which uh, in retrospect uh, proved not to be true. Randy Schultz, who published and the band played on in 1987, wrote about the before and after moment, and he was writing about when AIDS came into the, everyone's life. Everyone had a before and after moment in, in the gay world especially, because their lives were ripped asunder by this epidemic. But there's also a before and after moment in the scientific world, and it's the day after this press conference when the practical solutions start moving forward. The scientific charge to develop a blood test and get it on the market, to develop drugs, to develop a vaccine, those are the after moments to me. It's after the cause is proven. Uh, the Wall Street Journal boldly says that there's a race to develop an AIDS vaccine. That was a myth. There never was a lot of industry interest in doing this. Companies came and went, and it says, charmingly, a Nobel Prize to the winner. This is in September of 84, and this is still based on the idea that many people uh, had that it was gonna be easy. Um, Rock Hudson makes the epidemic famous in a way that it hadn't been before these days, but note that the first story about Hudson, the day before it's revealed that he has AIDS, is about him having liver cancer. So I believe that was misinformation put out by his publicist. But the next day, um, he went public, or it became public. The first AIDS vaccine trial took place in Zaire. It was not reported at a scientific meeting. It was not reported in a scientific journal. It was reported in the New York Times. And it was Daniel Zagari, who a friend of Bob's. And, um, and Bob said that uh, 
if anybody stumbles on a way to open the door, it might be this guy because he has a good smell for what's going on, but he said he wouldn't do similar things because he'd be afraid to do it of having troubles. That turned out to be prescient. Uh, as, as I'll get to in a minute, um, he did have troubles later because of these studies. Um, AZT comes out, approved in March of 1987. That's uh, Robert Schooley, Chip Schooley, who said a lot of people should be happy about this. Um, a lot of people were, but, but it also led to a lot of anger and a lot of frustration, in part because of what the drug sold for. It was very expensive, in part because people didn't have access, in part because it didn't work that well. As you can see by October of 87, there are already stories about um, people wasting away despite the drug. So it had become popular within a few months that this drug had limited efficacy. Um, there is a cold peace between President Ronald Reagan and Jacques Chirac, brokered by Jonas Salk, to stop a feud that occurred over the blood test patent and the royalty money. Um, that occurred after the US um, press conference, and it was um, a, a very high, a lot of lawyers on both sides of the pond fighting over this. And I say it was a cold piece because uh, Jean-Claude Germain, who's part of the original French group that Francine worked with, said in this article, I cannot help thinking deep inside of me that it was a surrender. So there are people who, in that moment, who are at the front, are not happy about the peace agreement. This is from the book Covering the Plague, one of the few books that looks at journalism and uh, AIDS coverage. It came out in 92 from a Los Angeles Herald Examiner reporter, a paper that no longer exists. And he just charted with the CDC's help uh, the number of stories that had occurred. And as you can see, there's a very steep increase from 82 to 88. This is uh, one of the most unusual newspaper articles I've ever seen. It ran 16 full pages in the Chicago Tribune. It was written by investigative reporter John Crudson, and it resurrected the feud between the French and Americans over who discovered the virus. Made uh, Bob Gallo's life difficult, um, I think that's fair to say. Uh, triggered investigations by the NIH, by Congress. This um, is a story of a coalition. My interpretation, my rendition of ACT UP, the AIDS coalition to unleash power, the NIH and its final hour. Can you say it with me? Storm the NIH, let's go. Storm the NIH, this is war. So ACT UP by 1990 had become a very large and powerful movement. They had already shut down the FDA. They had shut down Wall Street. And on May 21st, 1990, they shut down the NIH. For all intents and purposes, there were police riding on horseback. I was there that day. Um, a lot of it was comic in ACT UP's way. And Tony Fauci, who's head of the uh, largest AIDS institute in the US government, um, said it was interesting theater, but it was not helpful. But he also said these are intelligent, gifted, articulate people coming up with good creative ideas. So Tony Fauci really had started to create a bridge between activists and the scientific community that uh, didn't exist. And, and that day, they burned him in effigy and several other leaders, which is why he said it really wasn't helpful, because there were a lot of scientists who were reluctant to become involved. And Fauci believed that the activism was pushing people away. That's me in 1991 at the International AIDS Conference when I had a lot more hair. Um, and I show this picture because I was in a um, press room at the conference filled with a few hundred journalists. 20 of them, I would say, made the AIDS epidemic their main beat. I was terrified constantly of being scooped by these incredibly good reporters. And I was routinely scooped. Um, I just uh, went to the International AIDS Conference in Durban South Africa this summer. The New York Times, I don't think, was there. The Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the Washington Post, all of my former colleagues and competitors, uh, their institutions didn't even send people. Um, the interest in AIDS has plummeted from that period of time when uh, worldwide there was perceived to be a great story to tell. I would argue that the story now is possibly more compelling than ever. This made AIDS, uh, these three people, Magic Johnson and Kimberly Bergalis and Ryan White in the United States, 
made AIDS a popular disease. It could happen to anyone, to quote unquote innocent people, because the whole stigma and discrimination that had happened with gay men, well, it couldn't apply to a hemophiliac. It couldn't apply to a, a young woman who goes to her dentist. It couldn't apply to our favorite thing as sports stars um, who was heterosexual. None of it fit with the earlier narrative. And, and it created a sense that this could happen to anyone. It created a sense that you should care about this, even if you really don't like homosexual people, which was part of the narrative up until that point, and largely driven by a political uh, portion of the po political le leadership that reinforced that narrative again and again. There also was a rise of another type of advocacy. This was a lobbying campaign to steer $20 million to a therapeutic AIDS vaccine trial that the scientific community had not uh, collectively said they wanted to see, that it wanted to see happen. And, and indeed, it outraged many people when I wrote this story and exposed the lobbying campaign that take, had taken place behind the scenes to put $20 million into the Defense Department budget to run a trial that scientists hadn't decided was worth running. And it was led by a company that hired Russell Long, the son of Huey Long, and the whole thing was, um, an, it, it, it was as I quote a, a researcher saying it, it was a, an incredibly outrageous move. But that's the level this had gotten to. The epidemic had so attracted concern now that you could hire a lobbying team as a company and try to steer money into your own coffers to get around a, a very established peer review system that says scientists should decide collectively how to spend public money like that. The doom and gloom was incredible. The 1993 AIDS conference in Berlin, this is in Washington, D.C., in the Names Project. This is the quilt. If, you don't, if you've never seen this, these are people who have died in quilts in their honor. Um, this is just the United States. But doom and gloom was everywhere because the drugs that were on the market weren't working very well. AZT had, I think, an 18-month survival benefit in combination with other drugs that had come forward. There was a little bit more of a bump but people were still dying routinely, and it was still considered a death sentence. Um, the uh, Crudson article led to uh, an investigation of Gallo where he was found guilty of misconduct, and um, later all charges were dropped, and the appeals board that um, essentially wrote the final verdict said, one might anticipate that from all this evidence, after all the sound and fury, there would at least be a, pal a residue of palpable wrongdoing. That is not the case. So that's how that story ended, after a great deal of time and effort um, to fight a battle that, uh, to many people at the front, had been settled earlier. I went to Thailand in 1995. This is somebody dying from AIDS. Um, it became apparent by the mid-1990s that this was a global problem and that the antiretrovirals were limited in much of the world um, and in terms of access, their effect, as I mentioned, was limited. And every place had its own epidemic. In Thailand, it was largely an epidemic driven by um, uh, injecting drug use, heterosexual sex work, and also uh, men having sex with men. Um, there was this hope surge that occurred in the mid-90s. Every journalist loved to do the hope story about the vaccine. Um, I put it on top of the Obama poster. Uh, the doom and gloom ends in 1996. The first report uh, it, that I saw publicly of drugs working was at the retrovirus meeting in February. And you could see by those two curves that people were, were living in a way that they hadn't before. And the idea of eradicating the virus came to the fore. The idea of cure became a topic that was no longer a dirty word or as dirty. The champagne was completely uncorked. The New York Times, when AIDS ends, the end of AIDS. And David Ho was the um, man of the year uh, on Time magazine. There was a Berlin patient that many people forget about. This is Berlin patient number one. Um, and he had gone on the drugs and gone off the drugs, and the virus didn't come back. So there was this talk of maybe you don't have to take the drugs for life, especially if you treat people early enough. Bruce Walker had studied him, I believe, Bruce, didn't you? And, uh, and, and it raised a, a new possibility that was very exciting. So at this point in time, the major science puzzles had been solved. The low-hanging fruit had been picked. We knew how the virus got into cells. We knew the epidemiology, what was driving it. And these drivers of spread were the same 
uh, they had, each country had its own collection of these drivers, but we knew how the virus moved from place to place. We knew at this point by 1999, we knew the narrative of the origin, and the origin story has attracted a tremendous amount of media attention. It came from chimpanzees. We know that it probably came from uh, Cameroon, moved down the river to Kinshasa. Hunters probably, these are hunters I met in Gabon, um, and, uh, and, and it moved down to Kinshasa, a major new city, and took off there. And th these are all people I met dying from AIDS post-1996 all over the world. This is, uh, this is a, these are all different countries. All these people are dying. None of these people have access to any antiretroviral medication. And the mothers were still infecting newborns all over the world, and orphanages were still filled. And that bottom picture is a trial that proved that you could take one pill of nevirapine to prevent mother-to-child transmission, or to, to increase the odds of not transmitting. Um, very simple intervention. Um, but it was desperate because since 1994, there had been a known proven intervention that just couldn't be used in most of the world because it involved in, uh, intravenous drip and it just wasn't practical. And all of this fueled an AIDS denialist movement. The AIDS denialist movement said HIV didn't cause AIDS. Uh, Peter Duesberg was the head. That's me talking to Carrie Mullis, who won the Nobel Prize for PCR, and Carrie and I arguing about this, and then I got into a fight with the Mbeki, uh, when President Mbeki was president of South Africa, I got into a fight with Parks Mankanshlana, the head of his, um, his press office, who, his spokesman, and he told a lie. He said that he never met with me. That's a picture taken in his office that my photographer took when I met him at their White House, which I had to get in with documents and everything. And he lied and said he had never met with me and that I had created the story, and I said it's all on tape. I had it on tape, but then, I wasn't allowed to play the tape for legal reasons, which caused another problem. Um, then in Durban in 2000, everything changes because there is a movement to get drugs that are working to the world. The evidence that these drugs are working is overwhelmingly um, powerful and clear, and the Global Fund and PEPFAR are born, two large uh, financial mechanisms and bilater uh, bilateral mechanism to get drugs out to people, and today there are 17 million people in poor countries who have antiretroviral drugs, largely because those programs were born. Um, the first uh, vaccine efficacy trial, completely different headlines in the news, very confusing. Until this day, there remains debate about um, most uh, results from efficacy trials of AIDS vaccines, uh, except for one where it clearly didn't work and possibly even, or probably did, end up in, uh, infecting people. Um, activism has gone global now. Everybody's picked up on the ACT UP um, tune, and there's an era of fine-tuning. The drugs, the first uh, generation of good drugs are causing lipodystrophy, camel hump. There are many pills people have to take every day, and there's resistance. Um, so things have improved greatly since this period of time because now you can take a pill a day, and you don't need to take drugs that cause these side effects. And as people have reinforced here repeatedly, resistance rarely happens if you take your drugs every day. Um, I did a story for the New York Times Magazine in 2006 about pre-exposure prophylaxis, the idea that you can take a um, daily pill to prevent infection, like you would take an anti-malarial if you were going to a malarial region. Uh, I don't know what the Scientific Optimism website is, but they said, why not give AIDS drugs to everyone? John Cohen's bright idea. It wasn't my bright idea. And, and this ended up proving itself, and it's now a, a staple in prevention. Timothy um, Ray Brown on the left is the only person who's been cured of HIV. And he's Berlin patient number two. That's how he was known for quite a while. I would urge all scientists to refer to him as Timothy Ray Brown. That's his name. He's public about things. Um, and on the right is a man who has tried to take advantage of what was learned from Timothy by receiving a cell infusion that does a similar thing to what was done for Timothy of crippling his uh, CD4 cells so that they become resistant to HIV infection. Uh, the uh, evidence um, that treatment works as prevention comes out in 2011 in a study that shows that in couples where one person's infected, they don't transmit to their partner uh, if they're on drugs and their virus is undetectable. Uh, basically, it had 96% success, which leads to this idea that we have the tools to end AIDS epidemics. And uh, San Francisco, New York uh, State, um, they have blueprints of how they want to do this. They're actually ramping up greatly to try and end the epidemics. So right here in New York, it has one of the most prog progressive plans to end an epidemic. Um, 
South Africa is even discussing it. South Africa has 19% of the infected people in the world. And I just want to emphasize something. I did a book where I spent two years going to Tijuana regularly to meet with people who are infected or who are at risk. People are still dying from AIDS. You can see San Diego from Tijuana where I live. I watched this man die never having seen a doctor, never having had access to antiretroviral drugs. I put a recipe together of how to end AIDS epidemic at the end of my book about the Tijuana um, situation. And I did this in part to be a little cheeky, to say we all know how to do this. You might quibble with some of the things in my recipe. You can change it if you're the cook, but you're really not going to argue all that much. And I could get it onto a single page. Now we have these high-hanging fruit. This is my last slide. Um, the challenge is now to find a vaccine, to find a, a way to use antibodies. These are antibodies that are um, going to work against every strain. The challenge is to design proteins that can work as a defense or to uh, get rid of reservoirs in people in the sanctuary. These are all very hard to do. The reason HIV persists at this point in time is because it's a really difficult bug to make a vaccine against and it's a very difficult bug to cure. It's not because people aren't trying to do these things. It's that the low-hanging fruit, I believe, have been picked. So, I had kept this up on my wall for a long time. It's, uh, I wrote a book about the search for an AIDS vaccine. This is the day that the polio vaccine was announced effective. And the first sentence is, the world today learned that its hopes for finding an effective weapon against paralytic polio had been realized. I want to write that sentence one day about the AIDS vaccine. And I'm going to stick with it until I get to. So uh, I hope the people here who work on AIDS vaccines hurry up, because I'm getting older. And, uh, and I have a lot of people to thank, but uh, mainly the meeting organizers, Science Magazine, which has supported my work for many years, the photographers and artists who I've borrowed from here, and everyone who's given me their time to tell me their stories or to teach me about science. So thank you very much. Sorry I went over. Well, thank, you very much. thank you very much. Uh, for the sake of time, I think we take all the questions uh, during the hour uh, afterwards. So, um, now I would like to welcome Stefan Hildebrand, who's uh, a Swedish uh, documentary film producer and an old friend. He's also affiliated uh, with my university, Karolinska Institute, and he's been uh, filming the AIDS ep uh, epidemic uh, since 1986, and um, I take it more than 700 hours of footage on the AIDS epidemic. So, and you call it the Face of AIDS project, and you're going to talk about it here. Should I take this one? Yeah. Okay. I should know this, I'm a filmmaker, so, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker from Sweden, and uh, you know, our, our dream as documentary filmmaker is to have this one-time life assignment. Not just to do a documentary film and release it and discuss it, but also to be involved in something long-term. That's like a dream. And... Um, one uh, February day, very cold winter in Stockholm, I got a phone call from a person that I have heard of from the TV, but I never met. His name was Hans Wicksell, and he, he was the former president of the Karolinska Institute. <coughs> and the Karolinska is also the leading Swedish medical university, also awarding the Nobel Prize in medicine. So when a guy like that calls and asks for a meeting, you go if you are a young filmmaker. So I went to the Karolinska with the bus. I live just about 20 minutes bus ride from my home. And uh, I saw this guy. He, I made also a little research on him before. He was and still is an uh, international AIDS researcher. He was he's an immunologist and also like very close to the activists. So he, he'd been very important in the first years of fighting HIV AIDS in Sweden. Uh, in the activist side, but he was also involved in the international effort in the AIDS research for, uh, for a cure, for a treatment and for a vaccine. So he, uh, I went to his office and sat down and he said, I, 
I have uh, three teenage kids. They have watched your movies because I have done several movies about young people and social problems in Sweden, like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and so on. So they have watched that, and, and he had asked them in a breakfast, I need a filmmaker who should, can you, can you give me an idea? And then they mentioned my name, and uh, I went to him, and he said, you're a documentary filmmaker, I have a vision uh, as a scientist. It's very important to capture uh, the history, he said, and the history happens now with HIV and AIDS, 1986, long before the treatment. Uh, this was when a, a diagnosis of HIV was equal to a death sentence. And he said, I want you, if you like, to take your camera, your cameraman, and go out in the world, uh, capture the epidemic, talk to the scientists, talk to the activists, to the patients, to the public health persons, uh, to the social workers, the teachers, but all of these people who make up this wonderful alliance, the Global AIDS Alliance that started in the US with ACT UP that we saw in Jon's uh, photos. And I want you to do this for, uh, for at least 30 years. Because this is a chance, he said, to capture an ongoing epidemic live on camera as it evolves. And uh, he said, go home and think of this uh, and uh, we can talk further. And you know, in my brain it was just boom. Uh, I already made up my mind. I don't need to think three weeks. I like to do it. And I said, mind you, it's 30 years. Yes, I said. And then uh, he provided uh, through the Swedish National AIDS Commission and the Karolinska, uh, the first two years of funding, so I could go around. And the first major production I made was for the fourth International AIDS Conference in Stockholm, 1988, where many of you here uh, participating in the Cold Spring meeting were there in Stockholm. And then uh, uh, in Stockholm, Hans Wixell connected me to the Canadian uh, delegation from Canada that had the next international AIDS meeting in Montreal. So uh, he convinced them that I should do their film also. And then when I did the Canadian film, I, I, I had already uh, become a friend with Paul Wolberding in San Francisco, who was chairman of the sixth international AIDS conference in San Francisco the next year. And, and then he gave me the assignment. And then this is the way the project has gone on. And, uh, you know, uh, from the beginning, Hans uh, and his team at the Karolinska said, we are not so interested in the films you are doing. We are more interested in all the material that constitute the film, all the, the unedited material. Because that is exactly, you know, if you do a, a film uh, and you interview Gallo, you have one and a half minute, but in reality, I have one hour. So they said, these original material, that's what we like to have. And we like to do for the world in the future when there is a distribution system, because this is before internet, before digital video, before uh, YouTube. This is 60 millimeter film, very heavy, very clumsy, and you, it takes a lot of space. Uh, so uh, he had this idea, there will be a distribution system in the future, and then we should show the world. They, they, for young students and for researchers, they can go back and see the history as it evolved. Uh, the first trip I made was to Sydney, Australia, uh, after I accepted this assignment, and we made like a deal, uh, Hans and the Karolinska and I. And then uh, I came to uh, Sydney, which had a big uh, AIDS epidemic at this time. It was second to San Francisco in the Western world, with uh, six, 7,000 uh, gay people already infected when I came. Uh, and they had a, a strong AIDS activist movement uh, and uh, many scientists already working. So I came to a hospital uh, and filmed my first dying AIDS patient. I was not prepared. I, I did not see, uh, uh, I had not met anyone in Sweden. This went so quick, so I went away for the first filming trip to Australia. And it was Professor John Dwyer in uh, Prince Henry Hospital in Sydney, and we, uh, he took me into the room with the, with the cameraman and the sound engineer, and, 
And this guy was a writer, a young writer on the up, going up. He was a gay, and he had total crystal clear in his mental mind. And I was interviewing him. Uh, and uh, he knew that he would, in a few days or a week or so, die. But he, he explained the importance of fighting HIV AIDS, and he wanted to give his contribution by this interview. And then when we, in the mid, when we were finished with the interview and we were packing up our equipment, he, he started to sleep. Uh, and uh, we were very shocked, all three of us, the young sound man, the young uh, cameraman and me. So we were you know, going, sneaking out of the room and uh, Dr. Dwyer stops us and said, where are you going? Well, we are finished with the interview. Did you say goodbye? No, no, he started to sleep. We can't wake him. We can wake him up. He said, you have to sit down, take his hand. And, you know, he had carposis that come all over his body. And then I was forced to confront my own fear. And then we went into the room. He woke him up. He was still crystal clear after one or two minutes. So I sat down. I took his hand. He was very sweaty. And Carposis had come all over, so, so I, I was like scared, and, but I was sitting there, the sound engineer and also the, uh, uh, the uh, cameraman. And then we did that, and we go away, and then Professor Dwyer followed us to the elevator in the hospital. And then he said, you know, I know exactly what you are thinking now. You are going to wash your hands quickly. But I'll tell you, you don't wash your hands until you have lunch because this is not infecting you. And if you are going to be a, 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 doc, a chronicler of the epidemic, you have to fight you or your own fear and start now. And he was stern like this, and I, I was very moved. And we, we went to the elevator, and the sound engineer said, please, Stefan, can we take an early lunch? <laughs> so that day, and then uh, we continue to film other interviews in Sydney, coming to our hotel. I get a phone call in there. There is no mobile phones at this time. I get a phone call from Dr. Dwyer to my hotel room, 8 o'clock in the evening. We were just about to eat. And then he said, uh, I, thank you for the interview. Uh, I hope you learned something today. Uh, the patient died just a few hours ago. So uh, the interview was his last contribution to the fight against HIV and AIDS. Thank you, I said. And then from that moment, from that phone call, all the fear disappeared in my soul. And uh, I felt very humble. And that was a very important uh, step for me in documenting HIV and AIDS to fight my own fear. But then also it made me understand other people's fears you know, that you meet uh, in all this stigma that is still surrounding HIV and AIDS because you had it yourself one, one time far away back. Then I went to San Francisco to Paul Wolberding. Uh, it was also very a few days. We were one of the few film team. He really let us loose in the Ward 86, which was unique in the world uh, for treating, to try to find new ways of treating and also taking care and comforting uh, the patients with compassion. It affected me very, very much. And then I had this Sydney experience behind me. And then the first scientist I met was, first we went to the Pasteur Institute, uh, meeting uh, um, Montagnier and Francois and the others filming there, very interesting. And then we went to uh, Bob Gallo in his lab at the National Cancer Institute. And also uh, the activists, I think, has been very important, as I see it, you know, I'm from Sweden. We are a little Bernie Sanders, all of us. Uh, and uh, uh, so we think that uh, the, the, the activism uh, is driven, the scientists, the political establishment, the media, it has been a very, very important driving force. The two waves of activists that John described, the, the one in the, from the US in the 80s with ACT UP, and uh, also ACT UP Paris, very important. And then also the second wave uh, when the treatment came 1996. Uh, now I have worked for 30 years. In October, I started October 1986 with this meeting with, at the Karolinska. 
And uh, I just talked to Hans Wixell, who has been here at Cold Spring before, before making this trip, and he said, I said, at least 30 years, so you have to go on. <laughs> and my dream is like Jons, I like to go on, uh, I'm old now, but I like to go on until you can see uh, the cure or a vaccine or something like that. Uh, and uh, if it is not happening, then I have to, you know, teach a young filmmaker to take over the, what I have done. I like to finish by showing, I did some editing from the archive, and now all my 800 hours that I have done during the 30 years in 50 countries, uh, I started the same time as Jon. Uh, now everything will be uh, presented online in a digital format with uh, very relevant metadata for uh, researchers, students, and you know, anyone of interest. It will be free of charge. And it will be uploaded by the Karolinska in about one or two years. They are just working on it. Uh, but uh, I, and, and they own and, and curate all my 800 hours. So that was the initial goal that Hans and I had from 1986 is now happening. And I'd like to show you just some clips uh, from the archive and how you will navigate in it in one or two years. Thank you. A new disease known as Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS, was first identified about 18 months ago and now has public health officials They found worried. several cases where people who had been sex partners both had the condition. Researchers are now studying blood and other samples from the victims, trying to learn what is causing the disease. So far, they Speaking to you as the head of the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, but with the world contacts that you have, would it be fair to say that the drug development effort to fight AIDS is the largest and most aggressive international effort that has, that has uh, occurred um, for the, to, to find the, a treatment for a, for a single disease? In my experience, Dr. Mann, you're absolutely correct. The world is taking this very seriously. I think it is a serious issue, and I think we all need to be very heavily involved in this war on AIDS. That the city woke up and said that the people who are getting AIDS are the people of the city who could have lived if we gave them understanding, if we gave them education, if we gave them support and help. I don't see very many cells right now. Possibly the virus has killed all of them, but um, then it may try a transmission into more cells of cord blood again or to another cell line. That type until we can finally Well, we think the macrophage, as my colleague Zaki uh, Salahuddin was saying, could be an important reservoir for the virus. The macrophage doesn't die like the T cells so easily, even if it's triggered, stimulated in some way. The virus forms sometimes and still the macrophage lives. We have the beginning of understanding of why, but it's too complex and not useful to go into here now. <laughs> You been running four years till you get you got it made Only if you knew shooting drug needle give you AIDS Pump straight to the heart by the blood in your veins Mess up your life for minutes of entertain Who among you had sex last night? <laughs> Why are you smiling, huh? Uh, how many women did you have in your life? <laughs> No, 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 there's no problem about that. You will have a lot of women, but there's something you have to consider. Sex is a very important thing, and it is just like breathing. It is a normal function. But in the West, the idea of sex is presented in a very different manner. And this is a focal point, a focal issue, when we consider the issue of AIDS. I had to deliver the baby, no doctors tried to touch, it. touch me. They and afraid for you? They put me in a one, one place like a room that, like a, gar you know, like you, garbage like that. And uh, only nurse that uh, assessed 
Me, you know, oh, the my doctor, relatives. The doctors were afraid of you? Yes. And your relatives? They are all in only. And re relatives, they were afraid of you? Yes. I got AIDS in uh, 2001. Then I went to start center. They tested me, I was positive. The time I got AIDS, I used to uh, sleep with these truck drivers from Jobek to Zaire. This is my mother, they are looking after my my madam, okay. but for me, as, you know, sometimes get one, you know, you know, as a man, you need to have two, three, four, five, it's normal. Yeah, yeah at least I, mean, I need to survive. Okay. But how do you manage? Do you, do you use this, this stuff? These things, uh, I've got plenty of them, let me show you, I've got some. One of the great accomplishments of AIDS was that it led to the largest mobilization of public opinion and civil society around a health issue in human history, and probably around almost any issue. AIDS became a social, the fight against AIDS became a social movement. And that movement is, is there, is there to build on. I'm an activist because I believe, I believe in human rights. I believe that people deserve an equal chance of life. I believe just because you have HIV, it doesn't necessarily make you any less different than that other person that is HIV negative. I believe that whether you have TB or you don't have TB, we both are equal. And this is why I became an activist. It seems evident, but maybe it needs to be said, that the documentation of the epidemic uh, is extremely important. Otherwise, we'll, in the course of time, people will forget and we shall have mythology and not the truth. Now, step by step, the entire archive will be made accessible to the research community, to students, not only medical students, but you know, you have a behavior students, political science, religion, sociology, and many, many subjects that are interested in the issues related to HIV and AIDS. AIDS is related, as you said, to inequality between the sexes. It's related to social development. It's related to security. It has links with almost everything we do in life. Mankind has been suffering from many epidemics in the past. This is the first time, actually, when a new disease was coming up. You had an information sort of potential, a system, technology, and you could document it. And I found that most people didn't understand this. And I believe you are unique in this regard. And I feel this is a sort of obligation for mankind. It sounds big, but it is big. certainly open the, uh, for questions uh, from the audience. So I, what I suggest is that we try and end this panel at 3.15. So we'll hear from Vicki and then have questions. And that will leave us 45 minutes to hear from the organizers about their thoughts about the meeting and the, the history and future of, of HIV research. I think that's probably the best division uh, of our time. So it's really a pleasure to introduce uh, Vicki Harden, uh, Dr. Vicki Harden, who is uh, has been the previously the, uh, the head of the Office of NIH History and the Stetton Museum. Uh, she has uh, chronicled, uh, done historical studies on, on HIV AIDS, including the public debate surrounding this disease. Um, and she was uh, received her PhD from Emory University. So welcome, Vicki. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you still hooked up? Yes. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, I'd like to, every, it's all right. I'd like to thank the organizers <coughs> for inviting me, but much more importantly, uh, I want to thank them for hosting this meeting. I don't know when in the future we will have this many luminaries in AIDS research assembled under one roof. And uh, thinking about the uh, next panel, uh, I personally want to encourage the organizers to, to get these proceedings published because I think it will be extremely important. For myself personally, it has been a great pleasure to become reacquainted with and to meet in person for the first time what I think of as many of my footnotes. Uh, <laughs> It is also uh, appropriate that I have been asked uh, to be the final speaker as a historian because, as we all know, in the long run, historians always have the last word. <laughs> so, historians take a long view of events, often surveying uh, centuries rather than decades. So to begin this uh, talk, let's compare the story of medicine's role in three major historic pandemics. When the Black Death ravaged Europe in the 14th century, the plague doctor in his hazmat suit, featuring herbs through which to breathe to avoid the presumed plague-infested air, could do little for victims. People knew that the only hope for avoiding the plague was to flee to the countryside. When pandemic influenza struck six centuries later in 1918, medicine did understand airborne transmission and various theories argued for bacterial or viral causation. But lacking the tools to identify the cause, medicine could only offer symptom alleviation and public health warnings. Astoundingly in contrast, when HIV AIDS struck, medicine was able to identify its cause and develop diagnostic tools and therapeutic interventions that within 15 years transformed the disease into a controllable chronic condition. So in my allotted time, I want to reflect on how the history of HIV AIDS has already been told and how it will be retold in the future when none of us are still here to tell the story. First, I want to emphasize that there is no such thing as a single exhaustive history of AIDS. The story of AIDS is like a colorful marbled cake. One can cut, cut through it in many different ways to tell specific parts of the story. Writers of history also have personal interests and biases that may lead them to emphasize or ignore particular aspects of the story. Just choosing which facts to include means leaving out others. So the notion of some all-encompassing, definitively true history of the epidemic is unrealistic. Historians of the future will begin with the evidence that we leave behind as they attempt to synthesize and write their own histories. I want to look briefly at the five types of histories I have listed here uh, that have already been written and suggest what you can do to ensure that the parts of the egg story you think are important will be among the materials available to historians in the future. Media presentations about the epidemic overwhelmingly focus on the human suffering caused by HIV AIDS and the heroic stories of community activists in the face of prejudice. They capture an important theme of the epidemic. They emphasize how the conservative political climate of the 1980s delayed passage of legislation to help people with AIDS. They address homophobia in society and they tell stories of how brave individuals struggle to help those with AIDS. Medical personnel, however, particularly public health officials, medical researchers, and regulatory officials are often portrayed as slow to help or even obstructionist. I was most recently stunned to see, for example, at the end of the movie Dallas Buyers Club, 
a statement in the passive voice that, quote, something, I'm paraphrasing, but effective therapies were eventually developed, as if this was just something to be expected and really wasn't very important. There have been a number of books focusing on more narrow aspects of the epidemic. Uh, Jim Kinsella's book was the first to analyze how the media portrayed the epidemic, such as the problems it faced in talking about sexual transmission on television. One particular example uh, he cited was the 1985 ABC interview with Tony Fauci, in which journalist George Strait got Fauci to speak the words anal sex so that Strait didn't have to say them himself. Science journalists did a yeoman service in translating highly technical details into understanding uh, standable language for the non-scientist. And my colleague John Cohen's history of the effort to produce an AIDS vaccine is one fine example of this. Historians expert on individual countries have scoured them for evidence uh, about AIDS history, as John Alifi did for the entire continent of Africa. Scientist authors who undertake to write for the public also contribute to a broader understanding of particular aspects of the story, as Canadian Jacques Pepin did in his book on the origin of AIDS. Next, uh, I want to turn to personal memoirs. Here we see the, the memoirs written by Bob Gallo and Luc Montagnier about the research uh, on identifying the AIDS virus. Four others, which tell us about the epidemic from different perspectives, uh, are Randy Schultz's early, very moving account, Larry Kramer's caustic stories, Abe Vergese's narrative in rural, about AIDS in rural America, and Peter Piot's account of the UN AIDS effort to confront the global epidemic. Uh, via each individual author's point of view, uh, each book illuminates a particular, one particular aspect of the story. I, I have to stop, though, and note that all the authors of these books are male. We are missing the female scientist uh, point of view uh, still at this, this time. I must also mention the discredited writings about the epidemic because they exemplify a well-known historical occurrence. That is, that when medicine cannot provide preventatives or therapies that clearly halt the epidemic, uh, alternative theories and practices will appear and thrive. In the story of HIV AIDS, Peter Duisberg's challenge to HIV as the cause had profound consequences in delaying the adoption of antiretroviral therapy, especially in South Africa, even after it was demonstrated effective. The website virusmyth.com continues to perpetuate the Duisberg theory online, although its reach has been much diminished uh, since combination therapy was introduced in 1996. A rigorously researched book by British journalist Edward Hooper uh, reflects a different kind of discredited writing. Hooper suggested uh, in great detail how the pandemic originated and contaminated polio vaccine administered to Africans between 1957 and 1960. Later examination of stored vaccine samples, however, demonstrated that they had not been contaminated, thus demolishing his argument. On the fringe of the debate, we saw the conspiracy theorists. The earliest of these circulated in 1983, and it suggested that the CIA had manufactured AIDS. Alan Cantwell, a retired dermatologist, believed that because no formal history, no formal history, that needs to be done, of na the National Cancer Institute's virus cancer program had been written and published, the program must have been a secret government program that served as cover for the development of HIV. Since NCI has laboratories at Fort Detrick, Cantwell argued that this was conclusive proof that HIV was being prepared as a biological agent, biological warfare agent. Turning to scholarly historical overview studies of the pandemic, the first account was by French physician historian Mirko uh, Gramek in 1989. In his narrative, Professor Gramek emphasized the nationalistic rivalry between France and the United States in the race to discover the causative, the causative virus 
And he argued his own theory of pathocenosis, that diseases in the world seek equilibrium. Uh, this theory postulated that perhaps it was the elimination of smallpox in 1980 uh, that destabilized the disease equilibrium and allowed HIV to emerge. <clears throat> Writing from a postmodern view that disease per se does not exist, uh, that all diseases are socially constructed, was the book by sociologist Stephen Epstein, In Pure Science. It was published in 1992, at the time AZT toxicity was being assailed and before any effective therapy had been developed. This book and others like it reflect the emphasis on postmodern analysis in academic medical history circles. As physician historian Howard Markell noted, however, it's easy to, to say that disease is socially constructed until you happen to find yourself in bed with one. And in my own view, uh, I think HIV AIDS dramatically put paid to the notion that infect infectious diseases were not real entities. Jonathan Ingle's book, The Epidemic, takes a broader historical approach, but is light on scientific history and stronger on policy and cultural events. For my own book, my goal was to explain how the intellectual models of uh, molecular virology and immunology uh, that were emerging in the late 70s and early 80s guided the biomedical community in understanding and addressing AIDS. This brings me to one serious concern about how AIDS history has been and will be written. I see a large gap between how scientists tell the story and how some humanists do. Some of you may recall that in 1959, C.P. Snow, the Cambridge physical chemist and novelist, bemoaned what he saw as the two cultures, science and the humanities, because the gap between them was a hindrance to solving the world's problems. Sadly, the split has continued and perhaps widened as each camp writes for its own audiences. My examples here are the 2011 fine historical article by senior CDC officials, but it's published in Emerging Infectious Diseases for clearly an audience of scientists. And in contrast, uh, I offer a completely non-scientific quick look at a listing of one page of dissertation abstracts in the humanities and social sciences on the subject of HIV AIDS. Uh, if you can read the titles, uh, you realize that none of these dissertations require a lot of detailed scientific knowledge. They're aimed at an audience of their peers in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, this is all fine, but someone needs to bridge the gap. And I believe that scientists have reached across the gap more successfully than humanists, but both groups need to aim uh, work at broader audiences. So where does this leave us in thinking about uh, sources for the future histories about HIV AIDS? It hasn't happened yet, but maybe someday there will be a Ken Burns type documentary about biomedical research on AIDS. What evidence will be available for producing such a film or for the written histories that will certainly be produced? Since AIDS research spanned the paper digital divide, I fear that much of the early email correspondence reflecting collaborations and projects has already been lost. More successful have been efforts to collect oral histories of the epidemic. In the late 1980s, I began in interviewing scientists at NIH when I realized that no one else was systematically documenting the NIH response to a new pandemic disease. A colleague on the West Coast, historian Sally Hughes, compiled a wonderful oral history resource on the epidemic in San Francisco. Similarly, the activist organization ACT UP has been compiling oral histories from community activists and making them available on its website. Historians Gerald Oppenheimer and Ronald Bayer interviewed New York physicians for their book on AIDS doctors. Their original interviews are available to scholars on request at Columbia University, but not publicly uh, accessible. And recently, I am delighted to report the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have launched an oral history project with their personnel who were on the ground in the early years of AIDS. 
These represent just a few uh, oral history collections. What is yet missing are systematically collected oral histories from many other countries in the world. Archives and museums will also be the sources of information for future histories of AIDS, and what is in them depends on who donates. My colleague on this session, Stefan Hildebrand, has already shown you some of his work with the Face of AIDS archive. My other colleague, John Cohen, has himself donated the research materials for his book to the University of Michigan. The Names Project archived panels of the AIDS quilt and can make them available for study and exhibits. The collections of the Stetton Museum at NIH, to cite the example that I know best, uh, holds artifacts as varied as a bottle that contained original AZT tablets and a book of children's drawings about AIDS from the NCI Pediatric AIDS Ward, as well as scientific instruments used uh, in AIDS research. And the National, whoops, the National Library of Medicine uh, holds a wonderful collection of AIDS education posters from around the world, collected by Bill Helfand. Some of you may know he uh, was a Merck uh, executive until he retired. To end, I want to suggest what you should do to ensure that the history of HIV AIDS will have available evidence of how the biomedical community in our time addressed this pandemic. Future historians will not read every single one of your fine publications documenting the step-by-step -step accrual of knowledge about HIV. They need guidance about how you thought about your work, with whom you collaborated, what the difficulties were as well as the successes, they will want to know about the process, not just the triumphs. To get at this, you should sit for an oral history if you haven't done so already. Perhaps the most important task, though onerous you will think uh, for you, is to organize your unpublished documents, scientific notebooks, emails related to your research, your photos, your artifacts, and donate them donate them to an archive or museum. And I hasten to add, you don't have to do everything at once, and it doesn't have to be perfectly organized. That's what archivists do for you. These archives and museums are sometimes thought of as dry, dusty places that scientists occasionally like to make fun of. But they are the repositories that will preserve the evidence of your work long after all of us have departed this life. If you're able and willing, pull your story together into an article or personal memoir and get it published. The bottom line here is that you should not think, yes, yes, I'll do this when I retire. We're all working a lot longer these days, and you may not retire until you are so physically or mentally diminished that you no longer have the stamina to do the job. What does not get saved goes into history's black hole, never to be written about again. I encourage you to, to take action now so that the scientific story of HIV AIDS will be available to the future. Thank you. I should clarify one thing. When I was reporting on what was reported on, I wasn't telling you my opinions about things so much as showing you what the major stories were over time. And Bob was concerned that I weighed in about the controversy uh, between the French and American governments and the scientists, and I wasn't. I was simply telling you that was a major news story, and it was. And uh, don't kill the messenger. I think that we owe a lot of thanks to both the French and American teams for collaborating the way they did, and that's my own historical opinion about what really happened. But that's not necessarily how it was always reported. Yes. Yes. I'd like to uh, begin by congratulating all three of you who are heroes of mine in your, in your own form of media. 
and uh, give you one reflection and then ask you to help solve this problem. Um, in the beginning of AIDS, I used to feel like AIDS topics and health topics in general were not being treated as seriously by journalists as, for example, national defense and things like this. Uh, then we went through an era afterwards that John referred to where there were lots of very good people who understood the whole story and when a breakthrough came through they could put it in perspective themselves. Now we're in a situation not only of declined, diminished interest in AIDS, but the, the newspaper itself is a ghost of its former self. So we don't even have daily journalism, you know, for the Lori Garretts and the John Cohens and the Donald Drakes and all these other people to write to because there isn't any newspaper in most cities. I mean, USA Today is our newspaper. So what do we do when we want to, I mean, the kinds of talks you heard today are not easily interpreted. And scientists always will have enthusiasm about the importance of their discovery. You know, a cure is around the corner. And, and you know, you have to be, you have to really know quite a bit to put that in perspective, so neither to dismiss it nor overpromise. So what do you suggest to all of us who would like to hype our own work, but, but without eventually being criticized two weeks later for overhyping it? John, you want to say, talk to that first? It's complicated, and it's very hard to promote your work and not hype it. Um, but uh, one thing you can do when you are speaking to journalists is make sure they understand what other people are doing that's similar to your work, so that it broadens beyond you simply tooting your own horn. Maybe even tell them some people who don't necessarily agree with your thinking, and then you get more of a balance, and you can, you can remove the hype that way. There is good AIDS journalism happening still. The Pulitzer Center started 10 years ago and it recently funded a project of many young journalists that I worked with around the world. They put out a book that's free, it's an iBook called To End AIDS, it came out last week. I'd encourage you all to look at it. I think there is a lot of really good reporting still happening. It's just not in that old form of newspaper. And I still find a lot of reporters who open my eyes to things, but it isn't what it once was, that's for sure. Uh, I could add one thing and that is I think the sci you who are working in the science field should be a little more personal because you have very interesting personal stories also beside the professional careers and discoveries that you make. And the personal story when you tell it can be a bridge between the scientific work and the public opinion at large, something like that. <laughs> I will say one more thing. Um, I, I think you need both the personal and uh, more um, easily understandable side, but don't be afraid to archive your serious science. Um, if we look back, uh, how many people in the general public would have understood Robert Koch's science in the late 1880s, 1890s? Not many. Everybody knows bacteriology if they go to high school these days. The same thing is true with uh, DNA. DNA was brand new. It was very complicated, but people, DNA has become a metaphor in our general conversation. I think in the future, people will know more of this science, and I can guarantee you that there are historians of science who just eat it up. They love to sit in the archive and figure it all out, and they will learn your science. Yeah, I, uh, John clarified something for me that was important. Uh, I don't want to waste a lot of time on it, but I do want to emphasize that really the problems came from the press conference and then the patents for the blood test, none of which the scientists had any role in. I was called back from Cremona, Italy from a tumor virus meeting because Secretary Heckler found evidence of our papers in press, in science and elsewhere, and she felt she had no choice but to make an announcement. But I had just told the people at the Pasteur Institute, you know, if these viruses are the same as what you described last year, we have a lot of isolates. The problem, I think, is over in terms of etiology. We've got a blood test that's scoring close to 100%. We can grow the virus forever. It's a lot of data. So we'll make a joint announcement. I come back, call back. A mistake I made was entering that room, and that caused uh, problems. But I would like to stress many times, and it's the easiest thing to say is that 
there was an argument over who was first. All one has to do is go to the press conference and read my transcript. I made it very clear. It's in my archives, by the way. Okay. Are your, <laughs> yeah. okay. The whole transcript. Yeah, the transcript. I'm yeah. sure you've read. And I said um, to a reporter, don't use the name I use. Use the name also from the Pasteur Institute. Maybe use double names until we get a common agreement and discuss what it really should be. And I made it very clear that what was new is I had to say, you know, I had to say something. What is new is we have a lot of data, and I'm saying what they couldn't say before. This is the cause, and we have a blood test for it because we can mass produce the virus, and we're scoring about 100%, as you saw in the paper. I, Bob, I think if you were to do an analysis of how many words have been written about the AIDS epidemic oh, yeah, yeah. and were to stack up how many of those words were about that controversy, oh, it's immense, probably immense. the most covered topic yes. within words. Yes. And, that, and was, that was my real point. And, and, I know, John, but you know the sensitivities here. You know, I, know, I, was I know, orders, I know it, remain, it remained sensitive, but yeah. it, was, it was a heavily covered thing so in the no media. doubt. I, I was saying, I was satisfied with what you said. I, I was, I don't know what you call it, but I was ordered that I couldn't talk to the press. Yeah. So you couldn't even defend yourself. You just had, a, okay, here, here goes, and you go back to your yeah. lab. And, and you know, in, in, all, in all fairness to you too, the press was often inaccurate and often extremely biased on one side or another. And you know, a lot, a lot of the media, if you look back at it, about the controversy simply isn't accurate. And, and it's, it's fictional to anyone who was there. As you, as you know, and in closing, we sent a lot of reagents to yeah. the French group to do their work. Yeah. and the idea I, to look for a I, I encourage anyone who hasn't talked to people who were principals and who has seen the movie and the band played on mm. to speak to the principals mm -hmm. about the difference between what's in the movie and what they think really happened. I think it's an interesting contrast. I, yeah. I understand that there are a lot of older people who in second relationships um, are HIV positive because they figured that they, if they get AIDS, it won't show up before they're dead anyhow. So they're having unprotected sex. I will and say what can that be done about the this? senior population is one of the most at-risk populations for getting AIDS because they don't think they're at risk. Uh, or, they, when they were young and sexually active, they worried about getting pregnant. And once they passed 50 and didn't think they had to worry about getting pregnant, uh, they didn't think about STDs at all, especially about AIDS, and so they are at risk. Now, uh, your argument that they, they don't worry about it because they may die first, it may be there, but <laughs> I would worry about it if it were, <laughs> were me. And I also wish. because they, they know that HIV can be treated. You know, you take a pill every day if you get it, and it's not the end of the world. So they're not so worried. That is... That is true for the younger group also. They, there, is a, there, there was a film that I found very chilling. I think it was called The Gift, uh, where young gay men wanted to be infected to be a part of the community because now it could be treated and it wasn't any really big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Those drugs are very hard on your uh, liver, your heart, your kidneys, and uh, getting that message out is another problem. I have a very short question. Is Thank there you. any effort on the part of journalists and historians to not necessarily make stories which are sensational, but also in, make it interesting for readers for some other ways? I don't know if that's a possibility. Well, I, I think certainly what Stefan's doing has, there's nothing sensationalist about it. There's no spin whatsoever. and. I certainly struggle to not do things in a sensationalist way, and the editors I work with um, certainly don't want to do that. So look, there are, I think people misunderstand the media all the time. There are really bad journalists, there are a lot of competent journalists, and there are some journalists who are exceptional. It's no different than science, it's no different than garbage people. It's always the same, and it's a bell curve. And so yes, there are some who, blow things out of proportion. They do tend to get more attention, but they're not the main bulk of the journalists I know. It's, not, it's just not how it works. And there are historians similarly biased, but the good news is that in the long run, when we are 200 years out, they will not have the personal interests that people have today, the personal biases, and so they will, take, they will review the 
evidence. That's why you want to leave the evidence and make a more balanced judgment. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for a most uh, delightful discussion. Thank you. If we can have the th uh, four organizers please come down and sit here in these chairs. Uh, we have exactly 40, uh, 39 minutes for this session. 38, Bruce says. Um, what I would like to do is maybe to have each of the organizers uh, take a minute or two and talk about uh, what, uh, what the, meaning is, uh, the meeting has meant to you, what the history, the future, just to summarize in your own, in your own words um, what this meeting has meant. Why don't we start? Yes, please. Well, um, I started this meeting with um, the sentence that uh, the past helps the future. And I was actually very, very happy to hear it again and again from those who made this happen, fight against epidemic and uh, putting tremendous effort to what we already know, 35 years against AIDS and against HIV. I have a few slides just to show you that uh, in the scientific world today for the 35 years, was 35, how many, 400, it's, it's not easy for me to do it here, but um, it was 400, was 400,000 um, articles published, and I'm talking about scientific work. I'm talking about scientists. So it was really important. Um, I don't know how, how the, the green. Um, so when David Baltimore, today, this morning, he gave a talk, he said, and this is his quote, HIV is the best understood virus on the planet. So what we thought here at Cosmic Harbor Laboratory, and actually the idea for this meeting, for this topic came from our president, Bruce Stillman, so that it is incredible effort from scientists. And maybe it will be absolutely incredible effort for us to bring those major contributors to the field, to this place. And we have succeeded. And this is the all. And we've heard 63 talks and discussions. And uh, our idea now to let the world to hear the scientists. So this is how it's happened. We really wanted to bring, and as Vicky said, it, it was incredible, but it's happened. All major contributors, scientists to this field, were in this uh, room for three and a half days. So, and I advise you all in, in probably in a couple weeks to come to our site and you can see on the top HIV AIDS research and its future. So all the talks are, will be available there. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, would you like to say a few words? Uh, uh, you know, just repeat what she said. If we're gonna talk about the meeting, I've had, I don't know how many people, maybe a dozen that are participants that said it was the best meeting they've ever attended in their career, uh, and uh, one or two commented there was never anything like it before, and there will never be anything like it again. Um, I actually agree with all of that. I think it's the best AIDS meeting uh, ever uh, in this um, unique. Let me say, you know, you, uh, there was meetings with more data, but this was the most uh, thoughtful, conceptual, and you get the feeling, I guess, for the individuals. I really feel like I got to know people in the field. I know John forever, but I get to really know John, for example. You really get to know the person and the, the thinking and, um, and see the development of the field from, uh, I think, the best people you could get your hands on. So, and, and on the internet, everybody can tete-a-tete -tete speak to Bob <laughs> because they can hear his talk or everybody else, like all other 63 people. Yeah, well, I didn't know that. But we would, I think a book is important. I don't know who, that was your idea, a book, yeah, and uh, maybe getting it into a journal, we'd have to condense though, uh, for a journal, for a book, maybe not so much condensing, but uh, uh, yeah. John, your thoughts? Yeah, um, this, the meetings that we usually go to are very scientifically oriented. You hear a little bit of background, scientific background and, and then what, what people are doing and so on. We, we came into this meeting with a, a somewhat different concept, and one of the things that we encouraged the speakers to do 
was to weave the science of what they were doing along with their own personal story. And I, I think we were, quite frankly, I think we were very successful at that. And I just learned a lot from the, from the different backgrounds and the way, the, the way all these different people kind of approach these problems from different directions. There were people that came into it because, there are some people who came into it because they had relatives who, who had contracted and died of AIDS themselves from personal experience, and then there were others who came into it more like me, who, because they, they, they were challenged by the interest in the scientific problems, and others because they were physicians and they really wanted, they saw a real problem for, for treating patient care. And the, there was an extraordinary collection of getting these people together. And then there were, of course, activist community as well. And we, the, 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 the extraordinary combination of these, I think is unique actually. In clinical. It, it, to my, it, it certainly contrasts, for example, okay. with the way cancer research has progressed over the years. It's, it's approached this now more, but when I came into it, you know, cancer research was very much in camps. There was there were the oh, clinicians yeah. and the yeah. scientists, and they barely talked to one another. I think and it was you, Paul, that said that to me last. Paul, yeah, you. Right. yeah. And um, I learned and something from Bruce before he talks that I Bruce talked about funny things that happened to him, and that he was right. you know bad going into science, bad. And I've used that when uh, I talked to students, let's say at a graduation or something, because students love it to hear how many times you fell on your head and how dumb you were. <laughs> yeah, the but, ceiling but, fell on him. But uh, I thought, it, I learned at this meeting, so do adults. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. everybody was very happy to hear right. you falling all over the place. <laughs> but but <laughs> let me close with, with one other remark. If somebody also asked me, it was Hildebrand, where is Stefan? Where are you? Yeah, right there in front of me. You asked me on the uh, interview, what, the first question, what's special about Cold Spring Harbor? And, you know, he caught me off guard. And I was looking at the beauty around me and the buildings, and I said, you know, maybe it's a modern cathedral, compartmentalized <laughs> cathedral. We look at it that way. And I think, why did we have such ease in attracting everybody? Well, I, you think it's you only, but it's the grounds here that. <laughs> no, it's you think. <laughs> no, it, okay. It's the grounds here, the history here, and Jim. I think people know that this is uh, Jim's home. And I think that uh, adds to the need to come. The, want, the desire to come, the well, environment in total, was not just us good organizers, but it was an easy place to get people to uh, agree to. Well, it, your turn. It, let me just add one thing to that. In addition, Cold Spring Harbor has sponsored the most important science meeting in, in, in retroviruses for about 50 years now, actually. I've been to 44 of them over the, over the years, every yeah, single one since 1975. Ones. And there's those Banbury ones also. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it was really fitting that the meeting was here because Cold Spring Harbor and Banbury have played such a central role since the beginning of the epidemic in bringing scientists together. But um, I came into the field as a physician seeing patients and being confronted with a new disease where we had no idea what was causing it. Uh, all we knew is that people died really rapid deaths and with a lot of pain and suffering. And what was, what was interesting to me about the meeting was just tracing the history of this from the very beginning when everything was a black box to sort of categorizing and, and, and cataloging how HIV slowly revealed its secrets to, to, to us as clinicians and scientists and looking at the progress that's been made since the beginning of the epidemic, it does seem on the one hand like we've been working on this for decades, but that's a very short period of time given the enormity of the, of the problem. And you connect those dots and you can't come away uh, but be really inspired by the notion that we are actually gonna solve this problem when you see the progress that's been made thus far. And so to me, the meeting actually ended up being really inspiring, and um, that's what I'll take away from it. Okay, we have time now. Uh, we have about 25 to 30 minutes for questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll start while you, while you get warmed up. I'll start with a little bit of history. That, uh, uh, history again. Well, I can use this one. Uh, summer of 19 HIV infected patient was uh, seen at on the, in the Cancer Institute, admitted to the branch that I worked on. And the, we rotated in order. And a young hematology fellow from Hopkins 
was rotating at, at, at the branch, and he had responsibility for this patient. And what ensued was just the worst of all downhill courses. It was six weeks of just one disaster after another. And um, at the end of that six weeks, um, there was kind of a strategic decision at the branch uh, not to see any more of these patients. They were just too hard to take care of in the clinical, clinical center. It's, and it's called a clinical center because it's not really a hospital. Patient number two went to Tony Fauci. And I'm, I think back upon that, and I think, boy, that was, I, I'm sure glad that worked out, because certainly <laughs> Tony has uh, certainly uh, mobilized the NIH and has led NIID in a most persuasive way around, uh, around HIV care. But uh, it was a, a moment in time when, when things could have, you know, could have been uh, somewhat different. I always wonder what happened, what if I'd have been one place back in the order? What if I'd have cared for that patient? What would have happened? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. There was a question here. Yes. Yes. Um, I have a lot of friends. Um, can, can, can you wait for the microphone? Yes. Um, I have some friends, and the gay men friends knows, know about uh, pre-exposure prophylactics, but my straight girlfriends don't, and neither did my microbiology teacher. So um, I just want to know why it's not... Um, widely advertised or people don't know about it? Um, well, I, I'll take a stab at that. I, uh, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis, and it is, what it means essentially is that you take the pills that, that fight HIV ahead of time so that you don't become infected. And it's, uh, it's recently been shown to be really spectacularly effective if people take it on a regular basis. And it sort of underscores a point that was apparent in this meeting, is that we do have the tools, if we could apply all of them now, to prevent infections much more effectively than what we're, than what we're currently doing. Um, it's just delivering those things, et cetera. It's also an issue of education. And, and there, I think we have to make much better effort to educate the population. Warner may actually want to talk about this because one of the cities that has been the most effective in rolling out PrEP and, and preventing new infections is San Francisco. So, Warner, do you want to say something about that? Oh, I could say something, or Paul could say or something Paul. as well. Um, San Francisco is, is, has a program called Getting to Zero, and that is exactly what they're trying to get, zero new infections uh, with HIV. And uh, they're making steady progress. Um, treatment as prevention is one of the uh, getting, making sure that everyone who's infected is on treatment, suppress their viral load to diminish their ability to transmit. Uh, but the curve really turned down when, in fact, PrEP was uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis was introduced more broadly. You have to know that when even soon after PrEP was approved, it was not welcomed. There were uh, it, it was it was viewed with great skepticism. But now the, the, the communities are really embracing it, and it's really rolling out uh, FDA approval, CDC guidelines, uh, reimbursement for PrEP. So it's really moving, and it is highly effective. If you take the pill, it's 95-plus uh, percent uh, effective. So it's, uh, yes, that, that I know. That I know. I just, I'm concerned for my friends because I feel that if that's another reason, way that they can protect themselves at, what is it, 98.9 percent or something? So again, we need to be better about communicating the, all of the tools in the prevention toolbox. Hi. Hi. Um, PrEP actually remains controversial in, in much of the community. I think in the AIDS community, it's less controversial, and almost all of the uptake has been in gay men, where it's even less controversial. Uh, it, is, it remains controversial in heterosexual populations, and of course the efficacy trials were very, very mixed in heterosexual populations when they were done. Um, the other thing is that your girlfriends have to also think about pregnancy, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and things that are much more common uh, in women. So it's important to give holistic sex advice to people. Now, what I, the other thing I want to say, though, is that um, Patrick Sullivan, who is on our faculty at Emory, uh, along with AIDS View, is setting up uh, something called a, a PrEP locator, which will give uh, throughout the country in every county where people can get information about PrEP and can get PrEP. 
So that's something that could be advertised because that's something that would be thousands of places where people can get it. The other issue, of course, is paying for it. And, and following the FDA and CDC guidelines, which involve, first of all, HIV testing, but then also clinical studies and toxicity studies and repeat follow-up. A lot of these things are barriers to the normal uh, young people who are reluctant to sign up for Obamacare. So I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky business, but, uh, but the prep locator should help anybody who wants information about it. And there should be information to people on how to get it, when to get it, how often to take it. And what I'm waiting for is uh, injectable prep. Because I think the adherence compliance issue is a problem with everything. I mean, we have to remember that condoms are 100% efficacious. And efficacy is always higher than effectiveness, which is much higher than program impact. So if we want program impact, we've got to get something a lot easier than daily pills. That's just and philosophy. Maybe worth just saying what you mean by injectable prep for the uh, local uh, long duration. Yeah. So this is basically a, a drug in a form that would be given as an injection um, every few months, um, ideally even less frequently than that, and would give adequate drug levels so you wouldn't have to take pills every day. And it has been a real um, a, a real challenge um, globally in terms of dealing with the HIV epidemic, that adherence, being able to take the pills reliably every day is key to success, and, um, and that remains a, a really big challenge. Um, um, as anybody who's tried to take a two-week course of antibiotics knows, it's hard to remember to take pills every day. I certainly wouldn't tell a young woman that she could take PrEP and avoid condoms. They should still use condoms. And, and the other lesson is, is from the family planning history and family planning literature, which we can learn from. You know, what are those technologies which really improved a woman's right and a woman's ability to have sex safe, safely? And one of those things is long-acting uh, uh, contraceptives, or so-called LARCs, which have, have saved many women, millions of women throughout the world. To that point, I'm not an expert in this, but I have heard um, people from these at-risk communities um, using the excuse for taking PrEP that they could then slack off on other methods of prevention. And that's a, it, 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 it's something you don't like to hear because PrEP is, you miss a couple of pills and it's no, it's no longer working. And, and it's still experimental. And um, so that, that kind of disinhibition, I think, is, is still a, a problematic issue that I think needs to be dealt with. Well, what has been discussed uh, these last days has been where should you put the money uh, for research vaccines or for PrEP that we just discussed or for cure? So what's your opinion about this? My, my answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> but if you have to choose. <laughs> probably Emilio. Uh, it, 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 you know, I thought you were going to ask me something different. That you said you were going to ask me what we could have done better. But, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, forgot already between there and here. I, <laughs> I know what you could be doing better. No, but not less wine at night. Come. <laughs> oh, if you answer that question, I, I, that's so full of controversy, and I don't think anybody really has an answer to that. You can, the, and, you know, Emilio wasn't very optimistic about future for vaccine. Albert Sabin, before he died wrote to science of vaccines, and now that I understand what a retrovirus is, a vaccine will be impossible, yet we work on it. And there is increments of progress. I, you know, I was going to talk about it, but I saw that there would never be any time, but we have something that's in phase one now. It's based on, I think, rational concepts. It's going really good in primates, but I already know the antibodies don't last. And I know that's true of all GP120 vaccines, and I know that they should all fail unless we solve this problem. So for me, one of the things I want to do is while this goes slowly forward, is, and we're now funded to do so, is try to understand why and correct it that the antibodies to GP120 don't last very long. But I, you know, right now I think PrEP is important. I think, you know, I, if Harrington were here, he'd be screaming at us that that's a lot of things that would, has to be done. I think in high risk groups, it's certainly something that has to be very strongly considered. And for me, I, I'm not, as you know, and I don't want to get debates with some colleagues uh, about it. I, I wrote what I thought in science this week, as was quoted, uh, shown I, uh, by 
uh, by someone who thinks differently, <laughs> but our Australian queen. Uh, but you know, you, you could debate it. And I like the idea of long-term virus suppression. If we had a, a pill, um, you know, every six months, every four months or something like that, and we had a reminder for it, and that really worked. I mean, after all, we live with bacteria, we live with other viruses. If this was a, became a harmless virus that you took a pill three times a year for, gee, I wouldn't complain. As long as I know I'm not being hurt and going to die prematurely from something else. The other approaches are highly experimental, and in my view, they're potentially uh, have uh, spin-offs we don't want, side effects that we would rather not see. And I, I believe those side effects will be seen in some of the trials, or, or there's something missing that I don't understand. Because uh, when you start playing around with activating T cells uh, and it goes wider than the cell that you're after, I think you, you, we know from monkeys we get in trouble. So I don't know. I, I mean, I, that's the direction I would go. And um, that's the answer to that. So I, I certainly think all three. I, 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 mean, I couldn't say stop this or stop that. So we divide the pie, whatever size the pie is, and hopefully it's not one of those Frisbees I used to get when I was a kid. Frisbee, remember that? Is anybody yeah. old enough to remember Frisbee pies are that big? So, so okay, so uh, this uh, has Could been I a, say something is, also? Yeah. I mean, there, you know, this uh, has some parallels to the polio epidemic, I think, and Barry Bloom, a former um, dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard, made a comment uh, to me once along the way that, that really st stuck with me, and that was that there was a lot of controversy about where to put funds during the polio epidemic, should you make more iron lungs that you knew could save children's lives, or should you put those funds towards a vaccine? And obviously, uh, in the end, the vaccine uh, has has obviated the need for the for the iron lungs. I think there's some parallels there that we 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 have a lot of tools that we can do for prevention, but we're we're really not getting at the root of the of the epidemic then. Um, uh, through that, we have this smoldering epidemic that can still flame up, and I think we we have to work towards vaccines and cure in parallel. Okay, this has been a history meeting. So, uh, and you were all here during the epidemic from its start. In the hindsight, is there anything that you would have done differently? <laughs> yes, uh, I would have. Done differently, I think I learned something that uh, a scientist has power, and when you're the only you're in the only group that really was aware and knowledgeable in depth of the story, and um, you, you really do have power. And I did not realize that, so there was a committee formed between leaders at HHS, and I was on it, and I lasted a week. And I asked Jim Weingarten, the NIH director, why uh, this wasn't going on. He said, "It is, but you're not on it anymore." I said, "Why? What did I do wrong?" It's nothing. He said, "But you know, the other people." couldn't spell retrovirus, but I should have demanded you needed somebody there. That's one I didn't do. The second um, was get back to the press conference. I mean, I actually should have said no, I'm not going. I mean, I it would have been in trouble, but how much trouble when you think about it? What could they have done to me? It's like Howard Temin, who came up many times in this meeting, told me that he once came to NIH when I was going through that dingle stuff that John Cohn spoke about who had been attacking David Baltimore, and now it was, it was my turn, Howard called a press conference on the NIH campus to give me help. And uh, Howard was then told if he entered the NIH campus, they would arrest him. He would be arrested. It was the day he had received the Presidential Medal. So he told me after, it was the one thing he really regretted in his career, because he had the press conference in a small hotel room in a little hotel near NIH campus. He said, they, what could they have done to me? And the answer is they could have done nothing. And uh, the third is more medical, and that's the hemophiliacs. The government in the United States was very proud of how fast they moved the blood test from our lab to the world. But we had the blood test in February 84, quite ready. And they came out with it in January, February 1985, it's a year later. So I was sitting with a family of hemophiliacs, everyone was infected. The father, he infected the mother, the children were infected, four. And he was mad at French government and what happened in the not using our blood test right, you know, for quite a while. And so he was suing and all this stuff. And then I said to him, when did you get infected? And he said, oh, July 84, there was nothing you could do. Then I thought about it, nothing I could have done. If we simply thought about it, factor eight was in concentrated packs. How many hemophiliacs are there? 
Six more technicians, maybe I could have assayed, if not the world, certainly maybe we could have set up for the United States and Europe and we could have saved many, many, many more lives. Uh, certainly hemophiliacs, not all the blood transfused people. We couldn't do that. We wouldn't have enough virus. We didn't have enough hands. If they so had been uh, sensitive enough, that's it. Well, yes, yeah. it was. Yeah, I think that would not have been a problem ultimately. I really don't believe that. So I know Robin made that point and I bowed to it, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. At least we could have certainly tried. So what, what did I not do? I did not do anything thinking that these things are being handled by the bosses above me at many layers. Not one boss thought of this, or if they thought of it, they didn't certainly do anything about it. So I think for me a lesson, the, the number one lesson uh, when I look back is that the scientist really does have power. When you are in a position of unique knowledge, like you have been, and uh, many people here might be in their country for a while, and you don't have to just take because somebody's your administrative boss. Uh, you mm -hmm. can just say, no, I'm, this is the way it has to be. I know more than you know. I didn't have the gumption to do that. So that's what I regret. John and Bruce. <laughs> um, personally, what I guess I could have done better was get my own work into AIDS research sooner. I, was, I had been working in sort of basic retrovirology since I was a, a graduate student in the late 60s. And um, so I had been working for many years in, on, on other retroviruses, but not HIV. And um, I, I followed the, the, the HIV story very closely as it evolved in the early 80s and even wrote a couple of, of essays on the topic during the 80s and early 90s. I actually didn't do any, start doing any research on AIDS really until the late 90s. Uh, sort of in a direct way, and then it was, and then, then that was actually by uh, accepting a part-time job to start an AIDS research, of what I believe, believe to have been a, be a very successful AIDS research organization as part of the National Cancer Institute. But I myself never actually turned my own laboratory's research to HIV and AIDS for a very long time after the start of the epidemic. Maybe it would have helped a little bit more. But I think I'm, I'm typical, actually, of quite a few retrovirologists who are quite slow to get into the, mm -hmm. quite slow to get into the yeah. business. Um, and I think that may have, uh, might have slowed down the, some, some progress. All the progress was remarkably fast compared to any other infectious disease that's ever come along. Yeah, Jonathan Mann yeah. used to said, fastest in history of the onset of a mysterious disease, 82 to 85. What happened? Yeah, but, you know, and could it have been quicker, not just from 82 to 85, but, but ever since then? And I think, I think one, of the, one of the problems that we had was that we made the HIV field very insular. Um, that was a plus in many ways because we had our own study sections. We had our own methods for... for allocation of funds, but what it did was it set the, the HIV virologists and HIV immunologists and HIV molecular biologists separate from the rest of the scientific community. We had our own meetings, um, we would see the same people, and I think if, if, um, if I think about what I might have been, to, been able to do more of is to really search out people from other disciplines who weren't working on HIV, help them to understand that what the problems were that we were facing, um, because I think that there, are, and I think this thing, the same thing stands today, that there are a lot of solutions out there for problems that we're dealing with um, that we're just not accessing because science is built in such a siloed manner, and because if you're not already in the HIV field, you'll never get a grant to, to study HIV. Okay. That's a question. Um, going back to allocation of resources, I was wondering if you could speak about um, what efforts are being done to um, confront AIDS globally and what you think could be done better. What efforts are being made to confront AIDS globally and what could be done better? Um, you know, I think that um, it's, it's remarkable in many ways how far we've come in terms of delivering antiretroviral medications globally. Um, there are some 15 million people on therapy now when in 2001, um, at the, um, just prior to the UNGAS meeting that sort of, uh, UN UNGAS meeting that, that addressed the issue of, of global HIV and this issue of treatment, there 
there was a widespread belief that you couldn't treat people in resource scarce settings. So I, I think there's a tremendous amount being done. The problem was highlighted by some of the talks here, and that is that for everybody that's going on treatment, two more people are getting infected. And so we're, we're, we're not making great ground, and all those people are going to have to be treated uh, indefinitely. A lot of that has to do with the, just um, health systems and, and building health systems. And you know, my hope is that through confronting HIV, you end up um, em empowering the local health systems to provide better care on a, on a broader sense. But um, you know, we, need, we need technologies to directly address the particular problems in resource scarce settings, like point of care diagnostics and things like that that really can facilitate getting more medications to more people. Um, and at the same time, um, we need to develop vaccines that don't just work here but will work globally. And I think there's a real effort uh, to keep that in perspective and that the vaccines that are be being developed now are really, are really focused on that. But obviously that's where the brunt of the epidemic is. Slim Karim presented data. Um, showing that the incidence right now in, in one of the um, ha most highest burden areas in South Africa is about 10% per year of women become infected. So 16-year-olds, uh, 10% of them are infected by the age of 17, 20% are infected, um, all the way up to about half of women being infected by the age of 25. So still really, really huge problems. Uh, Jim wanted to comment on yes. this. Yeah. Um, so uh, clinicians and historians and journalists are taught or learn uh, communication skills. And scientists do not always have the opportunity nor the uh, ambition to learn communication skills. I'm wondering um, how being involved in the early years of the epidemic and doing this work and being part of this sometimes insular um, HIV community what are some lessons that you've learned about communicating with multiple audiences? And what lessons um, or advice do you wish that do you give your um, uh, people that you mentor and that you wish someone had told you uh, before 1981? Um, well, I think we as scientists generally do a poor job of communicating our enthusiasm and um, our our perspectives and, and a poor job of communicating what it is we actually do. I think we also sort of turn off the, the uh, I mean, I look at this also from a fundraising perspective of trying to get people to understand that, that actually donating to science can have a transforming effect. And I think most people don't really understand what, what the life of a scientist is, that, that we, we operate from grant to grant. Until we get those grants, we can't do the work. It's, uh, it's really constraining. Um, so it's, I think it's really important that we, that we make that known. And I think that that's a, a learnable skill that we don't really teach people. Um, and everybody's totally overworked anyway, so it's hard to know how to find the time. But I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a really important point, and I think it's something that people really need to kind of think about. How can you, you know, sort of in an elevator spiel, talk about what it is you're working on and get people to really understand the excitement of We need more science writers or science journalists or, uh, and they need to be involved in more, perhaps more meetings and get to know people, et cetera, like has occurred here. I think that the, it's also very important to communicate, to deliver what you do to others. Because the notion about science is that it's a quite a boring person who always sits in the lab. I had when I was a little girl, because I, my mom always told me to go to the medical school, don't even think about science. But it's different now, but it's still not enough. People don't know about scientists. They know what it's produced, but how it's done, people don't know. So this is why we, this, even, me, even this meeting, scientists started from their lives. It's like, how did they become a scientist? What did they do? And it's, it's very important for public to understand, and it will be more appreciation if, they, if we collect the stories. Like, you know, I think Bob and Bruce, you've both been 
uh, scientists, activists, and I'd like to encourage everybody to be much, to use your rock star status and your credibility as much as you can. You know, people like Tony are, are deeply uh, hindered by being government employees, and they can only do so much. Uh, well, your article about the AIDS vaccine in the Washington Post, uh, people concerned about AIDS in Africa, when they hear that from Harvard professors or Maryland professors, or, that really means something to people. And I think that I'm really, I'm quite worried about commitment to AIDS. And I'll just mention two things. One is the big battle over the NIH budget the last couple years. Um, Tony defended it, but many other people above Tony and below Tony and around Tony were in charge of it. And so there's a big tendency to want to dismantle portions of the AIDS research budget at NIH. Yeah. We have to speak out about that because there's a lot of scientists who are speaking out for it. The yeah, second I wrote, thing, I wrote three or four editorials in the Washington Post yeah. in the last five years. They so had that no needs, impact so that at needs all to be anything. done. The, other, the second thing is, is, is don't be fooled by fake political commitments. And I'll take uh, the Obama administration and our next president, Hillary Clinton, as an example, the time when the end of AIDS was being advertised, we had um, a situation where there was no increase in the PEPFAR budget and an actual decrease in overall amount of money for PEPFAR at a time we were advertising the end of AIDS, which to me was a clear premature declaration of victory and moving on to the next priority. So if we're going to be serious about this in the long run, we have to be advocates as much as that. And I want to just throw in my biggest regret. I, I don't, since I have a microphone, and that is we inadequately dealt with the issues of substance abuse. I feel very guilty about it because I was told that that wasn't my agency, that was another agency, but I had the bully pulpit and they didn't and I should have done more about it because it remains the single biggest problem with adherence, compliance. It is the very roots of the heterosexual minority and, and children's epidemic in the United States and it's, it created a huge problem that we haven't recovered from and America still doesn't care about it. I, I, want, I want to address this just to all the scientists here. My first journalism job was at the Voice of America, writing for Special English, which is the widest, the biggest radio program in the world. People use it to learn English and have for decades. And we had a vocabulary list of 1,200 words, and we spoke at two-thirds the pace of regular English. So it went something like this. Today, four persons were injured when a hand bomb was thrown into a crowd. Now, I'm not suggesting you speak at two-thirds the pace or use 1,200 words. Limit your vocabulary and slow down. Those are two very simple things to communicate. Um, so, speaking uh, as someone who's just starting my medical and, um, and graduate education, I'd like to ask you, um, sort of as a group of panelists, uh, what advice would you have for people who are sort of entering into this world of HIV, AIDS, like research and clinical care, and sort of what would you envision the world would look like for us 30 years from now, like reflecting back the way we're reflecting back now? Who? Me? Yep. The, the panel, <laughs> collectively. Uh, you can start, Bob. <laughs> 30 years from now? 30 years from now, what's it? Hey, 30 years from now, well, yeah, Jim, Jim will answer that, yes. I, I think I would hope it would be gone, but you know, and so that you'll be working on something else productively. You know, I'd like to ask you whether we need a, a new short book written, uh, you could say, for the new administration. <laughs> Just, you know, not, to, not not 10 pages, not one page, but enough to read it, you could read it overnight, and uh, you would get the basic facts uh, of it, and you know exactly what was discovered when, and what is the situation in Africa, what's the situation in America, and uh, just make it clear. And uh, it should be written probably by a science journalist. Because the there you go. Put too much in. Right. I've noticed. What? Have you already written? 
And John has nothing else to do. He'll be completely responsible, too. I'd like to be able to read the book. Nice to know. From, you know, eight at night to ten at night finished. I'm a fast reader, but, you know, not too many facts, but just one of the policy questions. One more question, and just this person. I can just simply answer that science is running hard for the next week. I have advice for the next president. Is that if you had a. Yeah. You know, yeah. you paid someone $100,000. Oh, you, you uh, need the microphone. Jim, hold the microphone closer. Yes. Uh, hold it closer. Uh, just say. Just keep, uh, take a microphone. How much would it cost? Say, if Coastal and Harbor wanted to, they will publish it. Uh, I think a more popular publisher would be better. His microphone's not working better. yet. No. But uh, microphone uh, are we talking about it's a hundred thousand dollar effort? It's a million dollar effort? Okay. I, I think you could There's certainly do something. Two hundred thousand dollars, and you'd get someone to do it. Okay, no. And uh, yeah, can't you just go to a drug company or something like that? And, uh, John, do not you know, do like Gilead, and just say, you know, we want a book, and you'll be properly thanked at the beginning of the book. Who wouldn't have written it? But and how many people are there who could write? Are they in this room? Sounds like maybe we should get together a little group to talk about that, maybe after the session. I think you could write. There you go. Great. I second, second that. So your last question. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris. be really good at this. At the level which can communicate to these people. And... Uh, well, we'll talk. No, uh, but I think uh, I would hate to see this meeting end without uh, a book, but not a scientific book. I don't think, you know, what we need is a, a popular book to, to be read, read by a 15-year-old person or, just okay. or the President of the United States. Well, this is clear obligation of John Cohen. It's your obligation. No. no one answered her question. Uh, 30 years from now, I said I hope that the disease is gone, but if it's not gone, uh, it'll clearly be heavily clinical and complicated therapies, I suppose. There will still, um, still be people infected, and I think there will still be at least some okay, transmission. I, I think it's going to have to, hopefully it will decline substantially, but there's still going to have to be dealt with. And I would say um, go deep, not wide. Get, get a skill set that allows you really to have a meaningful impact. I think a lot of people sort of feel like there's so many different things to sample from. They may try and get out to be doing ahead of them being actually trained to do. We have one last question. Okay, I just wanted to very quickly say I've been a health educator in schools, and I started in New York City public schools with the sex, drugs, and AIDS curriculum, the first one ever put out. And I've been teaching it ever since. And being in this room with all researchers who I've followed over the years, it is like the first time I met the talking heads. You guys are legends, and I thank you for all the effort you're putting in. And uh, thanks for all the advances and keeping us in the loop. So thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.